All right, what's up, Reef Builders? Welcome back to another episode of Reef Recap. Happy April, everyone. We have made it. Fourth month of the year. Somehow it's here. We have a lot going on this episode. I'm going to be talking about probiotics, what it means to be a probiotic bacteria, along with some of the common commensal strains that are or commensal strains that are in most of the food products out there. First, we'll start with a, uh, a recap of the week, though. So there's a lot of big stuff this week, a lot of reef therapy stuff, a lot of videos. So if you didn't catch the first video, we went to Amir's house in St. Louis, did a whole tour of his tank. Super cool. He's got a frag tank table. So to the left of the main system, it's got a table that's a frag tank, which is awesome. So, yeah, we did that video. We talked about, like, you know, some STN that was going on in his tank as well. And I think it was an endolithic algae or fungi problem, which is very, very unique and pretty uncommon in terms of stuff you encounter in the hobby. As well as that, we also had our 100th episode of Reef Therapy. So it was all of Jake's, you know, friends and family together at the studio kind of talking about things and how uh, Reef Builders is progressing and reminiscing on all of the good times. That was also a very big episode. Um, then we had the 101st episode already come out too, which is another ladies takeover episode focused on cleanup crew and some fun stuff like that. Um, but yeah, you probably caught the April fool's joke. Don't dose peanut butter in your tank. Many people were asking me if I preferred chunky or smooth. I said smooth. There was a more even distribution of uh, linoleic acid. And then also we rolled out one of our first guest um, articles from the new, like, you know, send in your articles to us. So, so Mina, and I think he was in the live stream earlier. He had a really great article talking about Jake, Pokemon, a lot of really good stuff talking about, you know, the enthusiasm that Jake was able to bring to him and reefing. So we're going to have many more guest articles and new contributors rolling out, uh, pretty soon. So yeah, we're going to going through all of the applicants, things like that. Additionally, if you were here last week and you wanted to sign up for the community science project, but the Google form didn't work, we now have a working link, which we will send. So <coughs> Remy should be sending that in the chat pretty shortly here. But if you wanted to sign up for the carbon dosing community science project, the link will now be in the chat for you to sign up. There's a, a, you know, a couple basic intro questions. And if you get those down, then we will look at all of those applicants pretty soon. So that's kind of the recap for the week. Figured, uh, you know, might as well just get into it really fast. Let's talk about probiotics. So Remy, let me know if the Word doc is able to be shared. I might have to present an extra. Hold up. I didn't have this set up in the correct order. Present. Share screen. Share screen. Window. Word document. Okay. So, top level, let's talk about what a probiotic is. Probiotic denotes good bacteria, good biotic presence. So, that's where we start off with. These are the good guys. Now, there's a couple of common applications of good bacteria. This is stuff I'm taking, like I'm a biotechnology major. So, all I've had to learn about throughout my whole time in school is new cutting-edge biotechnology, which is probiotics. So, there's three kind of primary things we use probiotics for. First is bioremediation. So this is if you have a problem you want to clean up, typically biological or chemical in nature. So instances of this are like if you have an oil spill, they now have bacteria you can add to the area of an oil spill and they will actually break down the hydrocarbons in the oil and clean up the area. So using a biological presence or organism to remediate or clean an individual area. So another example of this could be like if you have a diazotrope, so like the hydrospace products. If you are adding in the hydrospace purple non-sulfur bacteria, those guys will consume excess nitrogenous waste in your system and effectively help clean it. So a lot of the clean products in terms of the bacterial additives out there in the market are typically filling in this bioremediative kind of uh, niche or niche, 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 whatever. Another thing is uh, modulating the immune response. And this is one that we don't really have on the market right now, but a lot of companies are claiming they have. So this can be through several distinct mechanisms. Heterotrophy is a common one. So having a bacteria you add to the system that eats other bad bacteria, 
You can have ones that will grow on a certain surface, which prevents bad bacteria from sticking to that surface. You can have a selective probiotic bacteria, which will produce specific metabolites, which then will inhibit bacterial growth. So for instance, some of the coral's best friends that are really always with it when it's healthy will produce localized antibiotics, which selectively inhibit many of the pathogenic bacteria you tend to find. So these are kind of three just general pathways that you can see with, uh, you know, immune-based probiotics. So examples of these in human health are things like lactobacillus. So you can add that to like, the, you know, that's like a common human probiotic that's on the shelves. So these things, you know, there's some evidence that suggests that they can help with like Crohn's disease and stuff like that. <coughs> but didn't you say not to use them because you don't really know what's in it, like human pathogens, or do I have that wrong? You have that correct, which I will get to. This is just breakdown of what the term means. Someone requested I covered this today, and I said, yeah, that's a pretty good topic. So this is just, you know, what, what, how we can look at probiotics, and then I'll go in with a, a magnifying glass and say, here is how they can be applied to corals, and here is what a coral probiotic should theoretically look like. Then I'll go through all of the common strains that have been disclosed that are on the market and say, is this a coral probiotic according to the definition we've established? Another thing is a bioreactor. This kind of goes along with metabolite production. So if you are like, you know, using a cloning vector, doing some crazy CRISPR stuff, and you want to produce a certain protein of interest, you can grow, you know, you can genetically engineer a bacteria to produce that protein and upregulate it if it's like a, you know, around an external stimuli. So for instance, you can tie the production of insulin to an operon, like a gene locus, which is then triggered by an external stimuli. So for instance, a lac operon. So if you provide an, basically an environment in the media they grow without any glucose, but you have lactose, this gene locus will turn on and say, okay, we don't have glucose, which you prefer to get energy from, but we do have lactose. So we will now metabolize lactose. And part of that being transcribed will then produce insulin as a byproduct. So you kind of trick the bacteria into producing whatever you want. So this is, yeah, really common with human insulin production now. Many other, like anything where you're doing genetic engineering of CRISPR and things like that, typically they will use bacteria as a vector to produce a specific uh, complex metabolite or protein because we can't really just engineer those very easily. You typically have to have the machinery to do it, which bacteria are easy to work with. This is really something that we don't have a lot of in the industry. The closest thing to think of here is like phytoplankton. So not bacteria, but they're basically like a bioreactor, right? So if I've got T isocrises, I'm growing that as a living organism that will then have very high amounts of fatty acids, which I can add to a system as a form of nutrition. So that's kind of the closest that we're, we've deployed this concept in the industry right now. So here are the common probiotics in quotations that are contained in some of the bacterial products that at least have been open source. So bacillus subtilis, lactobacillus, other bacillus species. And that's about it that I know of for sure. There's the PNSB stuff. There's at least a lot of data that's associated with coral. Most of these are terrestrial strains of bacteria. So I will go in and kind of break these down one by one now. I will have to share a different screen, present, share screen. Wish there was a more streamlined way to do this. Let's see if this is the whole tab. Okay, so first, <clears throat> in order to understand kind of what we're looking at, if we want a coral probiotic, we have to look at the microbiome a little bit more in depth. So like I say, this is not a hard and fast rule of every single coral out there, every single species, but rather this kind of gives you an idea of the average diversity of the holobiome or the microbiome of the coral. So there's culture independent and culture dependent analysis. So not every single bacteria that's in the world, like we, we can't culture it. Many of them require extremely niche metabolites that we don't know they need them or they require coal cultures, things like that. So they can only exist if they have other bacterial buddies they live with and it's a symbiotic type of thing. So using things like the same technology behind the aquabiomics test, you can see how diverse the coral's microbiome is between, between different species. Then if we're just taking you know coral mucus and culturing it out with different types of auger, different types of media, this is really all that we have the ability to culture. So a fraction of what's actually there. So that's the number one limiting factor in terms of the getting a coral probiotic is 
many of the good guys here that might be integral to coral health, we actually don't have the capacity to grow external to the coral and to culture them independently. So that's bottleneck one. Bottleneck two is you're going to want to have one of these bacterial strains. You're going to want someone that's associated with the coral, at least in my view. That's what makes sense to me. That's what makes sense to Michael Sweet. Like the functional core coral microbiome is potentially more important than the taxonomic microbiome. So basically what, what this is saying is that not every single species in here truly matters. We're really looking at gene function and functionality of these species. So you might have a lot of these that are relatively variable. So you could have, you know, different types of rhodobacter ACA that come in and ebb and flow with the population and the external po dynamics of the reef, but you're always going to have that one core diazotroph that is most efficient and most fit at that function. So if you really break it down bare bones, you've got like maybe 10, if I'm just using some head, you know, like head logic right here, that's not like an exact number, but you've got like a handful of microbes that are very integral. that perform the key tasks that keep the coral alive. And everyone else kind of comes in and fills in and like, they're like a temp worker or they can be bad, et cetera. It's always in flux, but what's not in flux is the fact that there is always going to be a bacteria for that important job within the coral. So if we're looking for coral probiotics, we want one, microbes that we can culture, two, microbes that are associated with coral, and three, a microbe that does a specific job the coral needs, and they do it very well. So those are three limiting factors already, which is should hopefully instill some doubt that many of the commercial companies out there have achieved this. I don't think they have. That's kind of my take at this. So here's just some examples of like BMC, so beneficial microorganisms is kind of what that term is, so probiotic. These are just some ones that like, you know, different researchers have alluded that could be beneficial. So if you caught my whole spiel about metabolomics and how that relates to coral disease, DMSP was a big infochemical, which recruits external pathogens. So obviously having a probiotic strain of bacteria that can break down DMSP before it accumulates in the environment, that's a pretty important function. That could be something that could really help a lot with coral disease prevention. Having uh, bacteria that produce excess proteins that break down reactive oxygen species, another role. So instead of just looking for, I'm going to add this guy to my tank and it's going to clean it. We need to be looking with a magnifying glass at very specific function and why we want to achieve that function and deploy it in terms of coral health. And I don't think that really many people like, so there's a handful in the market that are beginning to look at it. And there's companies like Hydrospace that are doing a good job of being transparent and saying, here's what our microbes can and cannot do. But many other companies that are advertising coral food, bacterial supplements, either A, don't tell you what's in it, or B, they're like, here's what's in it. And it does all of this. And which is a little bit of a stretch, I think. So if we look at some of the cutting edge papers here, like this is a uh, Actually, we're going to have a video out from the Butterfly Pavilion pretty soon with Sarah Stevens, and she actually was able to get this probiotic strain and utilize it on the MCAVs there at the facility. So this guy right here, yeah, he's the guy. He is the coral probiotic guy. So he was able to isolate a, uh, proto a probiotic that was specific to MCAVs, so the pseudo-altermonas species that actually inhibits stony coral tissue loss disease. And, I mean, they did the work with it. So, you know, you've got inhibition of common bacterial strains right here. They have Bacillus subtilis in there because it's a good model species. They had the entire pathway broken down for what localized antibiotic it produces and how. And then they applied it to MCAVs that were sick. And as you can see, here's one where they had fresh seawater. Here's the progression of stony coral tissue loss disease. Here is the probiotic added. So very, very clear results. But here is what, here's why I'm showing you this, is this is a probiotic that is associated with, you know, MCAV, like cavernosa like Caribbean species, and they recommend, like, you know, the Florida Reef Track Program recommends adding this only to MCAVs. This is a very, very niche and closely associated probiotic bacteria with MCAVs. This is not a one-size-fits-all thing if we're going to have probiotics. There's going to be very few species that are generalist that perform the given functions that we want in terms of different things in our systems or in you know, restoration facilities or outplanting facilities, whatever. So this is like another barrier to entry when it comes to developing a probiotic is you want to be as specific as possible because typically 
you're not going to have a generalist that can be uptaken by every single coral out there and it performs the same function. There are many specific associations within different species holobionts, and it's it's probably not going to play that well. So here is another layer of doubt on the fact that the industry has coral probiotics. Okay, let's look at one of the, like this was used to be in Coral Frenzy. I don't know if it's in Benipets or not, but this uh, Bacillus lichiniformis, I believe is how you pronounce it. So this is one that has actually been shown to be associated with sponges. So that's good. Right. Like, you know, Bacillus subtilis is like <laughs> pretty terrestrial strain. It's a gut, mike, you know, microbiota. But this guy, at least they found it in sponges. So it can reproduce and live in a saltwater environment. I kind of went down the rabbit hole at this strain in particular because I know it's been one that's been open source. It's like, OK, does this have potential for it to be a probiotic? I think writ large, if you're looking at it from like a top down view, it seems like a good idea on paper from a company trying to make money. Yeah, like here's like different, you know, compounds they were found using like, you know, HNMR. So like these are all basically broad spectrum antibiotics. So down here, antimicrobial peptides are reported to reduce the biofilm formation of both gram negative and gram positive bacteria. So yeah, I mean, both, it basically nukes everything. They've got several metabolites they produce that are antibiotics. They have antimicrobial peptides that they produce. So you add this in there, it outcompetes everything in the culture is kind of what they found. Now that can be beneficial if you've got, you know, a rudimentary understanding of coral disease. If your idea is to nuke everything, which I have already talked about ex extensively, why that is not a good idea, then yeah, this seems like your guy. It's sponge associated, which means it could grow in salt water. It produces all these things. Look at all of these bacteria that it kills. Obviously, if you've got a sick coral, you want to add that in because it replaces antibiotics. And it would. It relatively could replace an antibiotic you know, in this instance, but also what does it do downstream? That we don't know. Number one, it's not typically associated with corals. Number two, it's likely producing metabolites that are nuking everything in the holobiont, good and bad indiscriminately, which means it's deployed the exact same way as like the KFC dip or any other antibiotic is. Like, I mean, this is not really a good solution, I don't think. Um, yes, there are a lot of augers. <laughs> I mean, I can go down that rabbit hole if you want. It depends on what you're trying to grow. Sometimes you want something like Roseobacter to where the only carbon source it can really metabolize is, is DMSP. So you got to synthesize DMSP and buy all the precursor molecules for that. And then you got to put that in a plate as a sole carbon source. But that's because you're trying to grow one specific candidate. Uh, you know, there's there's rich media sources and there's also defined media sources. So selective versus broad is kind of what you're looking at. So with the rich media source, you can just throw in like yeast and beef extract that have kind of been freeze dried and powdered. And that provides the general basis of nutrition for most species out there. So then you can plop coral mucus on it, isolate colonies, and you're growing basically whatever is in there that can be cultured. But then, like I said, if you're trying to find a probiotic that can bioremediate a specific metabolite, then you want to make a selective plate or broth that only has that metabolite as the sole energy source. Therefore, if you then have bacterial growth, whatever grows in that media source um, can then be, you know, you, you know, it breaks down that compound and then you can do like different competitive assays to determine how well it metabolizes it, metabolizes it, things like that. There's a lot of deduction. Um, yes, you do need a delivery system, which I'll get to sooner or soon as well. So one kind of what I've talked about so far should hopefully put your head in the place of, okay, it seems pretty difficult to get a coral probiotic and it is, and to have the right microbe for the right job and something as complex as corals to where all of their health is regulated through microbial interactions, which is completely distinct from higher animals like ourselves. Oh yeah, we can take a pill of this. We can take a pill of lactobacillus and nothing really bad is probably going to happen. But if you're adding in copious amounts of this every single day, you're culturing it in a concoction, whatever you're doing, and you're adding a massive amount of colony forming units to your tank, who knows what can happen? It's probably out competing and or nuking many beneficial symbionts that are associated with the coral and your system writ large, because this is someone who is relatively foreign in terms, like it, obviously it's it's probably on reefs, right? Sponge associated, but it's not closely associated with corals. Therefore, you could really be throwing a wrench in things. 
So here's the delivery mechanism thing. That was going to be my next point, actually. So if you're just adding in a mass of colony forming units in the form of a broth or like a liquid suspension to a reef tank, you're likely not targeting the coral in particular. Maybe it'll pick up, you know, like a, a cell here or there, but likely it's probably just going to eat them. If you want to really saturate the holobiont and the coral's microbial community with a selective strain of bacteria you found to perform an individual and specific desired function, then you need a way to get it to the coral. Enter rotifers. This is something I talked with Chad from Reef Nutrition about, which was kind of a cool conversation. But um, I mean, yeah, rotifers are basically like a little microbe. They're like a little protozoa and they're just like a bag of water. And there's been a lot of research that has found that if you feed them selective uh, bacterial strains, the bacteria stay alive inside of the rotifer stomachs. And there's a lot of data that shows that coral eat rotifers. Coral of all you know sizes will uptake rotifers as a food source. So theoretically, to have a, a very good and targeted delivery system, you could culture rotifers and feed them exclusively the probiotic, and then you feed those to your coral. And likely that's a much more efficient way to get these guys to the coral. So this is yet another barrier to entry for having effective development and deployment of probiotics. So let's see, we've got like five, six sub points right now, which make it very hard to make this happen. So you want to have a bacteria that's associated with a coral. You want to have a bacterial strain that could be cultured that is associated with a coral. You want a specific niche deployment of that bacteria you want a function to be fulfilled which is another limiting factor so if you're just throwing in this guy produces antibiotics that's not really a good rationale for how to develop a probiotic and then you want to have a delivery mechanism for that probiotic and as of now there's no one on the market doing this those four things not happening at all and a lot of companies claim they've got it down They've got it. If you add this food, this secret sauce, it's going to make your coral grow faster. It's going to be probiotic. It's going to fight off the bad bacteria. Who knows? We probably don't have enough data to substantiate a lot of that. Lactobacillus, another common one that's in a lot of the foods. Optimal pH range, acidic. It lives in our stomachs. Why are we adding this to our tanks? How do they expect it to stay alive? Does not make sense to me. I mean, it could be utilized as a food source, I guess, but does it have the optimal nutrition for what coral are typically eating? Is it comparable to the nutritional profile of picoplankton that are on open reefs that are, you know, common in upwellings at night? I don't know. They don't know. They haven't given you data to show that they know. I would be suspect about it. So, I mean, yeah, I think what happened is a lot of these companies got pretty lazy and they said, okay, here's a probiotic that I can buy from a third party company. I can get lactobacillus cultures. Those are really cheap. They're like six bucks. Like, how much are they? Let's actually see. Lactobacillus, pure culture, for sale. I bet it's dirt cheap. Yeah. Yeah, like 50 bucks. And you could make an infinite amount of bacteria for that. Like, here's one that's like 20 bucks. Like, in terms of startup costs to develop a product, that is nothing to any of these large companies. So, yeah, they looked and they found the easiest option of a probiotic with that title on it that they could get for, like, for cheap that didn't really need any data behind it because they could have marketing hype of here's your probiotic for your coral. It's a probiotic in human health. Maybe it'll help coral too. Throw it in your tank. You find out. That's probably not how I want to do things in my system. I'd like to know what I'm adding and the effects of it. Another thing, this is a crazy one. So this happened a couple years ago, 2011 it happened, but they actually found there was a ton of die off in the Caribbean because of human waste runoff. So this guy right here, which is an opportunistic pathogen that's common in the human intestinal tract, basically was solely responsible for white pox. This is before, or kind of, I think, when stony coral tissue loss disease first started popping up. So 88% decline in Elkhorn corals and the Keys because of white pox and also associated environmental things. So this is not me saying that all of these strains that these companies have grown and massed and freeze dried and put in powdered coral foods is going to do this. But it is to say that introducing non coral associated strains to coral can cause problems. Obviously this is one that's opportunistic, at least in humans. So it does have some virulent capacity, but here's the thing. We don't understand 
you know, any of these associations long term. This is on the edge of human comprehension, a lot of these systems. We have to use meta barcoding to even get a peek at these, as I showed with this. Like, you have to use new next generation DNA sequencing to even see what's there. Like, we can't just culture this stuff and see what happens. So if you're telling me that if modern science is not confident that we know how every bacteria can impact the coral's microbiome over a course of time, that X company that found a cheap probiotic that they can buy right now that has the term probiotic associated with it knows what's going to happen downstream? I don't think so. I think that's a that's a pretty sketchy thing. And I think this is all, it's not, I won't say it's snake oil. I think that adding these things likely does have the bioremediative kind of angle to it. So if you're adding just an ass load of bacillus subtilis, lactobacillus, any of these guys, they're probably going to live in the system for long enough to where they could uptake excess aminos, excess nitrate, excess phosphate in the water column, and you could get them out competing some undesirable algae or at least lowering your nutrient values. You could have that happen. There's been people that have added Dr. Tim's EcoBalance, and over time they did see a reduction in the Vibrio populations. So like, you know, there's at least some anecdotal stuff that these can impact your tank in a positive way. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I mean, like I say, lactobacillus for human application is great, right? So, I mean, that's there's definitely a ton of science that if you're on like, if you're an immunocompromised person, like, and you're receiving just like every drug ever, then it just is wiping out your microbiome or you have like, you know, continual infections where you have to have constant antibiotics supplied that can wreak, you know, havoc on the microbiome of, of your body. I mean, there's brain microbiota now, which are found to be a, so like, you know, all of this is very emerging and is shown to be associated with mental health in many ways, because these guys will produce a large amount of the neurotransmitters that our body needs. Like, I think it's like 30 or 40% they've determined, which is a crazy amount. So yeah, I, I would imagine that it's probably, you know, some decent good practices being deployed now that if you're on a long-term treatment of antibiotics, you probably want to get some of those, those numbers up of the good guys. And that's great. The logic there makes sense. There's a ton of data behind it, but is there logic and data behind throwing that in a closed environment with a bunch of coral? To where we know that having the wrong species present, having uh, the good species die off because of being outcompeted by other ones, is what always causes a pathogenic event. This is what always leads to dysbiosis. I don't think we have that data. And I don't think these companies have that data. And I don't think they really want to look at that data because they probably want to sell these products because they're very easy to make and they're very cheap to make and they can charge however much they want for them. There's some that are like 20, 30 bucks, a little can. I don't know. It seems that money has overridden a lot of logical analysis here and that there were a lot of very key steps that could have been taken to analyze things from the ground up in terms of coral health that were skipped. That's my point in all of this is that I don't think there's really a coral probiotic that's on the market, at least one that's not coral associated. You know, there's the diazotrophic stuff from hydrospace. That's cool. That's cool. It's been shown to be associated with reefs in the open environment. But, you know, I mean, they can maybe produce some external metabolites that can help with pathogenic stuff. But there's probably better things that do that. There is better bacteria for that job. So while it covers some of that kind of immune response stuff, there's plenty of other candidate species out there that could do that much, much better that are coral associated. And there's even some that are generalist. So... I think the next 20 years of the hobby is going to be people with some deep pockets and people that can hire scientists that are capable uh, and have the techniques and have the experience of isolating a lot of these guys. And I think there probably is going to be products out there that actually have coral associated probiotics that serve a particular function and they are advertised for that. So, yeah, I mean, right now, though, there, this should hopefully cast a lot of doubt in your mind. I don't add bacterial products to my tanks. That's what I do. <laughs> I don't, I don't add them. Like, like why would I want to gamble with adding them? The hydro space stuff. I will. I culture, you know, rhodomonas. Like I add that that's a bacterial plankton. It's a little bit of like a larger cell size, but like, like what's the mark, what's the micron size of rhodomonas micron size rhodomonas. 
Lerda Moon is Selena. Selena? Selena? Uh, let's not say micron size. Let's say cell size. Wow, this isn't. This does not have any. Or here we go. Here's a here's an awesome picture of Taras being a mad scientist. Look at him. <laughs> Let's see if he has. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Eight to sixteen microns. Cool. So in comparison, cell size. I bet it's like one micron. Yeah. Like a, yeah. Okay. So these, like I say, this will serve the role of feeding a lot of corals. It is a bacterial plankton, but it's still not perfect, right? So the micron size is a little bit off. So you got like 8 to 16 microns on average, pretty large cell in terms of bacterial stuff. Whereas the picoplankton that a lot of these guys eat that we're like really like looking at with the, you know, probiotic stuff or aquabiomic stuff, like the community science, like we're hoping that we can find a carbon source that upregulates pelagiobacter populations. That's one of the big ones. But you can see it's like, three quarters of a micron. Like this is a very, very, like this is like the wheel on a car compared to like an airplane in terms of actual size difference. And a lot of like really weird guys like Dendronephia, Scalarionephia, stuff like that are probably eating these more so than even these. I think this is probably better than phytoplankton, right? But I think this is probably like the creme de la creme, like the petite object, ah, uh, like this is what we should be striving towards getting. Okay, gut load rotifers of rotomonas. Yeah, do it. I do it. Yep. That's exactly what I do. That's great. Do you think this could be from naivety on manufacturers part along with price point as well as where the probiotic is? Pro yep. I think that they are completely ignorant about all of this. Exactly. I think that none of these companies have really looked at this from like a scientific angle in terms of like cutting edge. Here's the coral microbiome. Here's how it operates. Here's the problems that can arise within it. Here's good candidate species. I think it. there is probably a point along the road to where they said, okay, we can maybe look deeper into this, or we can just say, here's a probiotic, and it's really cheap to develop, and we can get it on the market. And I think that they probably said ignorance is bliss, and let's go with it. So is that malicious? I don't know. Maybe there's some like weird Kantian like means versus ends type of way, right? Like I don't think it's like actively malicious, though. Like They saw this information and ignored it. But I think they likely in the R&D process turned a blind eye to looking deeper with coral associated microbes. And in terms of like ethics, who knows what that means? I'm not a I'm not a philosopher, but, you know, yeah, biodigest is interesting because it actually does contain some saltwater strains of bacteria. I have no idea how they produce this stuff. I've got a lot of ideas. But it's weird because it has some of the kind of commensal strains like Bacillus subtilis in it that you would expect for them to be adding afterwards. But it also has a pretty like ripping, like, you know, it, it's got some good diversity in there. It's got Pelagibacter. It's got some of like the better like uh, Rhodobacter ACA species, I believe, from what I looked at with what Telegram sent me. So there's some coral associated, at least marine associated microbes that are in BioDigest. There's just all of this other BS too. So it's like there, if you had bio digest minus the, like the human probiotic BS, that would be a really good product. I think it would be like live sand or live rock in a bottle is kind of how that would operate. But even then do we, you know, are there any pathogenic species in that? We don't know, right? There was some Vibrio populations. Now, not all Vibrio are bad. I'm not here touting all of that nonsense, but there could be opportunistic ones or, purely pathogenic ones that are in that sample. We don't know what the manufacturing process looks like. We don't know if there is, you know, consistency between batches that they produce. We don't know what the species are. So there's just a lot of questions. But from what we do know, BioDigest seems the most promising of a probiotic on the market. <laughs> yeah, they extract most of it from peanut butter. Yeah, linoleic acid. So if, if any of you read that, all of the stuff about linoleic acid and peanut butter was 100% true. All of that was real science I took from papers. So peanut butter actually does contain that high of linoleic acid. It's very concentrated in peanut butter for whatever reason. And they are now using linoleic acid as a replacement for antibiotics as like an antibiofilm agent. Or they're combining it with antibiotics. So all of that was real science. All the stuff I said about brown jelly in the beginning was also true. Like that stuff I found through my research. Of like here's how it works. Here's what it is. It was just BS applying it to brown jelly. That would not work. <laughs>
It would not work. It would be the same thing as like, um, oh, throwing this guy in there, right? So if he's nuking all of this stuff, it's like the KFC dip. Like linoleic acid would just everything, most things at least. It would also probably nuke the nitrifiers. So that's not a very good, it, it was like a real and practical replacement for antibiotics. That's completely true, but not applied the correct way. So I figured I'd get creative with it. Remy had the peanut butter idea. He had the peanut butter, no jelly thing. And I was like, huh, how am I going to talk about peanut butter being the cure to brown jelly? So my initial thought was maybe like I can have like a, it, you carbon dose, you know, act as like carbon dosing and it can upregulate the good populations of bacteria. So I went to chat GPT. I was like, peanut butter, what does it contain chemical wise? And it said linoleic acid. I said, there it is. We're going to run with that. We're going to go down the rabbit hole. And then I did. But um, yeah, so basically the, the role, of, you know, the goal of this talk today was to show you that you should probably be a little bit suspicious, be a little bit skeptical if there's any company claiming they have a coral probiotic. Like, let's see, coral probiotic for sale. <laughs> no way. The first thing that comes up, lactobacillus culture. What did I say? I guarantee that is the reason that this was included whenever one of these companies decided to include it. They probably quite literally Googled coral probiotic for sale. And it was the first thing that that was like the legit, the same one I just showed you look right there. Lactobacillus for sale. Bam. I don't know. That's pretty damning. Like I was just kind of talking saying like, this is maybe what happened, but this, uh, <laughs> that definitely seems like what happened. <coughs> My SPS journey is um, I need to get a bunch from Chris Meckley. We're trading. I'm trading him a bunch of high-end and weird Zoas for a bunch of SPS. So I'm ready to rock and roll. I got my AC fixed. I'm good. Okay, so let's see. Coral Frenzy. I know that it has the Bacillus species. Ecobalance, Bacillus subtilis. I've talked about ProBio. It's probably good. Benepets. I think Benepets claims they have Bacillus subtilis in it. Let's see. They at least had like a, yep, here we go. Okay. Lactobacillus. Bacillus species. And then live yeast. That's kind of whack too. I mean, it, that's probably not going to live in a marine environment. But marine fungi is a whole different world of stuff. I'm actually, I'm writing an article right now. It'll be out early next week, but it ought to blow some people's minds. I mean, I started doing the research for it and went deeper than I have before. And it, um... Yeah, there's some cool stuff for sure. I'm going to talk about vitamin C dosing and maybe bringing that back. Okay, so PNS ProBio is cool. Like, Kenneth is completely transparent with here's what's in it. Here's what it can do. Here's a bunch of papers that show that this has been associated with corals. It's been associated with a lot of stuff. Like, you know, it's like a rhizome-associated bacteria. So, like, in, like, terrestrial plants and things like that. So... All of these guys, like the, the rhodopseudomonas and stuff like that, are diazotrophs, meaning that they will consume excess nitrogenous waste and they will uptake it. So in the actual like reef environment, you have these diazotrophic bacteria, which typically are purple non-sulfur bacteria, like what are contained in this product. And they uptake nitrogen from the surrounding environment. And then the coral basically get that excess. It's kind of like the same association with like zooxanthellae. They will then pass on that as nutrition of the coral. The coral directly eat the bacteria, things like that. So yeah, I mean, there's also, you know, there, there's, you know, some anecdotal stuff with like out competing some of the RTN type stuff. That's more anecdotal, but yeah, rhodopseudomonas at least as a candidate is, is pretty decent. Here's the thing is Kenneth is like, here's what it does. Here's exactly what it is. And here is what it can be used for. He is very exact in his advertising. And he says, it has this function to fulfill. It's a diazotroph. It's going to bio bioremediate your system. And it does that. I think it does that. So that's cool. I at least know what I'm adding with this product. And it at least does that. Compared to whatever the hell all this is. You know. And some of this I do know what it is. I've tested it. And that'll be a much later thing. And some of it is very interesting. But... I don't want to spoil that. So stay tuned for that. I have no idea. It's an Aquaforest ProBio S. Let's see if they just say Aquaforest ProBio S. What a name. 
all these names are so like super pro bio. Let's see. Specially selected probiotic bacterial strains. Up, oh, look what they claim it does. Accelerate decomposition of organic matter. Bioremediation, people. That's all they can claim. At least they're honest with it, though. Does not say what it includes. So yeah, probably also Bacillus subtilis or Lactobacillus. Probably just a really hearty, cheap strain that, uh, yeah. Tried a new frozen food the other week and shortly after lost all my torches to brown jelly. Could a bacteria in the food cause that? Huh, probably, yes. But how? there's a lot of other questions there. I wouldn't just want to say, it's this food. And it caused brown jelly. I, I don't think it's as clear cut as that. Jelly is a very, very complicated thing in terms of how it or how it arises. And typically, you're going to have a very, very large abiotic swing associated with it arising. So, no, I'm not going to spoil part of my research. But basically, you have to have a if even if you have the bad bacteria, they are not going to just cause a pathogenic event. You can have a system with the most just screwed up microbiome. But if you don't have external stress to mess up the holobiont, then you're not going to have an infection. So like, let's say that, like, let's say you did add in this food and it had a pathogenic bacteria X. That's not like a surefire way that it's going to cause jelly, especially that fast. Now I would say, consider other factors. Did you overfeed? Did you have a very large phosphate or like nitrate swing associated with it? Have you added any other products, you know, trace elements, things like that? There's a lot of other things that could have gone wrong um, that could have caused that. And I would I would ask those questions first before just saying it's this product. <clears throat> vitamin C dose can be interesting. Yeah, I think that vitamin C dosing um, could be very interesting. And there's a there seems to be a very big correlation with it and some of the fungal diversity. Like I say, I won't spoil the article. It'll be a very big, beefy article, but it's pretty cool. Um, so, oh, here, oh, hydro, here, here we go. Kenneth is much more qualified to talk about his product than I am. He knows more than I do about the strain. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's something I was kind of touching on earlier is more so the function of the species in the holo biont versus the individual strains. So what I like about the hydro space stuff is that he is like, here's the function it does. Versus all the rest of this where it's like, does 90 things. It's going to fix your tank. Miracle cure. He's like, it's, they're, they're known diazotrophs. You're going to have them consume excess waste in the aquarium. There might be some anecdotal benefit uh, where they can outcompete some of the pathogenic species. But here's what it does. Here's the species. You know, if you want to add it, add it. And I think that's how all of these companies should be. They should be transparent about what strains they have and what is the likely function that's being performed with that strain. So, yeah, but, um, yeah, so I'll just, I'll hint about the fungal stuff. So I guess during times of stress, coral produce excess vitamin C in their mucus, and it's shown that fungal symbionts that are very important for immune response will grow in accordance to that vitamin C because they use it as just like, a, you know, they use it a lot for whatever reason. It's very, very core metabolite they can process and need for growth. So they will grow in accordance to a stress response. And there is maybe some belief that they help with remediating that stress and helping the coral calm back down through like, you know, reactive oxygen, like, you know, basically uptaking reactive oxygen species or potentially producing some useful metabolites that could be nutrition or producing antimicrobial compounds that outcompete and kind of downregulate the bad guys who might be like at an infection or like a wound site. So maybe we should bring back vitamin C dosing. Maybe we were doing it wrong this whole time and we're like, it's bacteria thing, but maybe it was a fungal thing the whole time. So that might need to be like another aquabiomics community science project is taking 18 and 18 S RNA testing. So not 16 S, but 18 S, which is like the fish pathogen one, but then you can see eukaryotic organisms with it. So we could do, we could do the same type of setup we have for carbon dosing, but we could dose vitamin C instead. And we could look at the fungal profile over time. I think that could be cool. And that's some next level stuff. Forget bacteria. There's a whole other world of microorganisms out there that no one's talking about. So you heard it here first. Marine fungi, vitamin C, reef builders exclusive. Stay tuned. There's more cool stuff too. But um, yeah, that's kind of my talk for today. We got 15 minutes so we can chill. 
We can talk about whatever. If you've got questions, points of conversation, concerns, things you would like to, me to talk about next week. Ooh, Sean has a very big one. Let's see. I think most companies don't source the heterotrophs for coral digest, but more for aquarium cleanup. Would love to see the research shown on bacterial specifics for the benefits of coral and not just the general cleanup. Yes, I agree with that. So yeah, like I think that like all these clean products make a lot of sense. You got a fish only system, freshwater system, koi pond. And I think the logic of having those perform that bioremediative task were taken and applied to coral care. And I think that that was probably a misstep. And that we probably need to, if you've got a full-blown reef tank, maybe step back and consider if there are any potential negative consequences of adding these strains in mass. And if there are better coral-associated strains that can perform that function. I think, though, for fish-only systems, if you've got a system with just, like, some xenia in it and you don't care and fish are your main concern, then, then yeah, I think that, like, all these clean products can perform that function. But... In terms of the interaction with coral, yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's there's Sean. There's a, a manufacturer right there. And I'm sure that part of the R&D process is also doing a little bit of snooping on what the competitors are doing. And there you go. Most use bacillus. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it seems like to me as well. Huh. For coral aggression, I'm not sure. That would be interesting. I am sure that there is probably some... You could find a probiotic, I bet, that would metabolize certain allopathic chemical responses. So, like, let's say that we can find XYZ compound that, like, sarcophytins produce that can directly inhibit fembrophilia or euphilia species, which I think I've seen literature about. They'll directly inhibit those species for whatever reason, uh, just like reef space or something. But you could then isolate those or synthesize those compounds, make a plate excuse me, which has them as a sole carbon source, and then just take some mucus, take some sediment samples, take some, you know, live rock, take some water and see what grows. And if you have something grow, then you would theoretically then have a probiotic, which metabolizes those allopathic chemicals, which would be very cool. So not direct aggression in terms of physical aggression with sweepers and things, but in terms of chemical warfare, you could definitely have a, a, a micro, you know, biology fix for that, I think. Yeah, I don't know. I, I want to test it. That's something that I, I want to get like all these Fiji mud sources and do an aquabiomics test. My my guess is it's probably just reef sediment. I don't know if the like the legality of that though, right? Like I don't know if someone can go out and actually collect like mud from the mud flats and export that. Cause I know that rock is under CITES. I believe it is. So I assume like the mud and stuff would be too. Oh no, you can see my I had my my black background set up all wrong this whole time. Man, that's disappointing. Anyways, um, yeah. So I don't know. I think that it would probably be akin to adding, like if it really was like Fiji mud, you're probably adding a relatively similar microbial profile to what you would see on the reef, but still pretty different. You're going to have different guys living in that area, like that inner tidal zone that's associated with sandbars and mangrove forests and stuff. Depends on where it's collected. It's going to really depend on that. If they have a consistent collection site, then you're more likely to get the same types of family families in that sample. But you know, there's if anything from the open ocean has the chance of having pathogens, has the chance of having all the good guys. So I don't know. Yeah, I like I say I've not ever done the vitamin C dosing thing. I talked to Meckley about it because I'm like, I feel like Meckley's probably done it. He was like, I noticed a lot of benefits with Zoas. Let's look it up right now. I'll look it up right now. Coral. Fungi, so anthid, good association. Oh, no research has been done, done on it. It's all reef to reef stuff that's popping up. Guess not. Worth a shot. <coughs> ah, I just saw Raj's comment. Let me read Sean's. The reason why some of this is difficult is there might be short term result and there's long term result or even consequences. Some element might be greater than the being dish long term. We interact with influences, which should be done. I completely agree. I think that's the same thing with traces. I think that both traces, especially the heavy and transition metals, and the weird things that there's not a lot of data about coral uptaking directly. I think there's that. And I think the bacterial side, in terms of existing products, need longitudinal data. I absolutely think they do. So this is something that Sean mentioned to me, actually. But, you know, the idea that lithium that cobalt 
that chromium, that a lot of these heavy, like mercury, you know, people are dosing copper, crazy stuff in their tanks. Could that just be uptaken? Like we see consumption based on consistent ICP testing. But my question is, is that consumption from the coral, from coral associated bacteria, from something else in the environment that maybe is not, that we don't want to grow? Could be turf algae that's uptaking it, or it could be absorbed abiotically. Rocks and sand could be binding to it and holding it in. This is a very common phenomenon we know with copper. Any LFS like you know that treats with copper and they have rocks in like the display systems or the treatment systems can't use that rock anymore. Even if you add like all the the cuprosorb in the world, there's always probably going to be some of that copper that's leaching back out. So what what my concern is is if we're dosing these heavy metals and we see consumption, there is yeah exactly what Raj said. Is it consumption or absorption? We don't know that. So I think that it would be really worthwhile putting money into seeing if corals directly uptake these things or if it's just being absorbed by some type of basically media in the system like that's pretty scary to me so you know the major traces that are well accepted there's a lot of peer-reviewed like manganese iron iodine yeah go to town absolutely all of those i think should strontium should definitely be added potassium you know boron there's tons of things out there that have a lot of data behind them but when you get to the cutting edge stuff to where it's companies pushing this now, A, you have to analyze from your perspective as a consumer, why are they pushing this to me? Is it to make money? Yeah, they're a company, right? So that's number one. It's a product. They make money off of it, which could be something that is a little bit of a rose colored glasses, you know, for them. That could be something that tints their perspective for sure. I'm not saying that every company out there selling trace supplements is like, super greedy and like money hungry. I think that most of these people probably believe that what they're doing is correct because they do see consumption. I just think from a skeptical point of view, we should step back and analyze, is it consumption or is it absorption? You know, if there's not peer reviewed data to where they've shown that corals uptake these things, maybe be suspect in adding it to your tank. Maybe. Ah, that is disappointing. That would, I, I heard about some dude that like had like a hole in his backyard or something and he kept digging in it and then <laughs> selling the mud that way. Maybe it was you that told me. One of, someone told me about that at Reefstock, I think. There was some old company and the guy got busted for that. He was just selling mud from his backyard as like Fiji mud, which is crazy. But the thing is now is we have we have aquabiomics. We have, tr we have ICP MS which, or OES. You know, MS is a little bit better, I think, in most applications. Um, we can see what's in it. We can send in, you know, we can see if there's like any trace uh, contaminants. We could see the microbial profile and get a good idea if it really did come from the ocean or not. But yeah. <coughs> yeah, that's the thing is all of these things are going to have to have external funding to answer these questions. I have, um, actually, I thought about some experimental design to do this. I think we could do a crowdfunding approach to reef builders. To where if people wanted to answer these questions, wanted to know like, okay, is lithium uptaken by coral? Yes, no. Is lithium utilized by Acropora and its microbiome? There's ways we could test that. It would require money though. It would require time. But I think that we could probably put together some community cash if people really wanted to answer those questions. So yeah, I think that the next 20 years of product development is probably going to be having more specific application as our knowledge advances with these things. Okay. I'm going to try to pronounce it. I can never say this word. I read it all the time. <laughs> molybdenum. That's, that's the closest I can get molybdenum. I don't know if that's actually how you say it, but that's a mouthful, but yeah, there's that stuff too. There's so many weird transition elements that people are adding like the halogens, a lot of data there, add the halogens, add your major traces, do it. Do the ICP thing. But ask questions too. Be an informed reefer. Skeptical reef keeping, Richard Ross, read it all. That's basically what I am trying to advocate through all of this is a rehashing and modern application of that. So be skeptical. Yeah. Yeah. You would basically need to have a company that's formed that has a lab space and gets money that has enough money. You got to have a lab space. You got to have funding. That's why I think reef builders lab 
offshoot of the studio. We've got a lab space, community funding. We answer these questions. BRS investigates, but far better with real science. Who wants Reef Builders investigates? I think that we could build together like a very good team with like actual scientists on board. Not me. Like I'm, I'm an undergrad, right? I just know about these things, but legitimate scientists, people with doctorates. Yeah. We got those connections through reef builders. We could put together a very solid team to answer these questions and it could be funded through community efforts. So community science project from aquabiomics, but turned up to 11 producing papers, producing data designing products that are tailored to the needs of the coral that we have. Just an idea. If people think it's cool. <laughs> yeah, you're completely right. I should be, yeah, I'm molybdenum. Yeah. Yeah. I had molybdenum about like once a week to my system. I just need to get used to having it roll off the tongue in that way. <coughs> yeah. Like, you know, those made like the major ones like iron and manganese, those are consumed so rapidly. Like, I just kind of like, up oh, I had them. If it's there, it's there. I'm sure something's up taking it. But yeah, you can definitely um, overdose it for sure. Any of these things can be overdosed. Too much of a good thing. Nice to see you on here, Sarah. Well, thank goodness. Yeah, so we got like four minutes left. What do we think? What are questions that you would want answered if we did this whole Reef Builders Investigates thing? Because now that I've got it out there, I can start planning. I can start pushing some numbers. I can start getting some things drawn up. We're not going to test peanut butter dosing. We will not be spending our time testing peanut butter dosing. I think traces would be very cool. I think that'd probably be like the first thing that I would do if we had the community sport would be looking at traces. Um, I have a very, a very, um, a very good suggestion for you. Um, you should add Coca-Cola to your tank. You should try it. You, if you're not opposed to maybe crashing the system, you should be the litmus test. So if you've not been on my streams before, I've talked about this, but Sarah Stevens told me at Reefs talk about this guy who's like works for a public aquarium. And they had a cold water system that was like 300,000 gallons stall out during the nitrite um, cycling phase. And they figured out that you could basically have the correct amount of phosphoric acid and a couple other carbon sources that are common in Coca-Cola. And if you add them, then you can overcome the, uh, the hump. And they added like 50,000 liters of Coke or some shit overnight. And they were able <laughs> to cycle the tank instantly. So yeah, if you... I don't, you could add Coke. You could try it. You could certainly try it. I don't know. That's up to you though, but I would say wait it out if not. Yeah, I would like to see, I need to get in contact with some people that are bringing in live rock from different locales. <coughs> Excuse me. Because I would like to test the different locales and see if the microbial population is distinct. Like I'm sure there's some different guys like, like dude, bringing in live rock from Ghana now. Like, we don't have stuff from Africa in our systems that often. I think that that'd be pretty cool. No, no, no. We got, we've got Coca-Cola, peanut butter, and Jack Daniels. Coke and Jack plus peanut butter. There we go. That's the future of the hobby. That's cool. Yeah, molasses. That's interesting. Yeah, it'd be like the same thing as dosing like sucrose. That makes sense. Yeah, I've heard people pee in their tanks. I've heard of that as an ammonia source for sure. Okay, so we've got about like a minute left. Any any last minute burning questions? If not, I will tune off for tonight. But yeah, if you just tuned in, it looks like our population went way up. In the beginning of this, I talked about basically what a probiotic is, how we can get and isolate coral probiotics, and basically why I think that no company in the market really has a true coral probiotic. So if you're interested in any of those topics, make sure to go back and watch them. Um, Remy, if you would send the aquabiomics carbon dosing thing in the chat again, if you were here last time or you've seen me posting about it, 
and you did not get, you were not able to form or like, you know, sign up. We have a Google form that has an actual functioning link now to the Aquabiomics community science thing. So Remy just dropped that in the chat. So if you want to become part of the Reef Builders Aquabiomics carbon dosing science project, then there's a, you know, assortment of questions there you can fill out. If you are the right fit, we will then choose you. You'll be reached out to over email eventually. Um, it's gonna, probably going to be like by May, maybe June. But um, yeah. Yeah, Microbacter 7, same thing. I bet it's seven seven flavors of bacillus, I bet. <laughs> that's that's my guess. But uh, yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in this week. We had the initial recap, had a nice little science lesson. So yeah, if you're interested, you know, be here next week at 745. Central. Uh, Jeremy is going on vacation next week, so I will likely be filling in for the article size. So I will have an article out like every every day next week, I think. So if you're looking for some science-based articles, I'm going to have a lot of articles. So stay tuned for all the new content com coming. We've got some really cool, interesting guests coming on Reef Therapy. A lot of stuff in the works. So thanks for tuning in. Be there or be square next week.